Thank you everybody for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us and to support our organization and to learn more about the research that we're funding. My name is Megan Donaldson and I'm the CEO of the Hereditary Disease Foundation and I'm delighted to welcome you here today. Um, thank you for taking the time to be here. And I wanna start by thanking um, all of our donors for making our research possible. Whether you're giving $5 or $25 or $100,000, every single bit helps and we are truly grateful for all of your support. So thank you. Um, thank you to our corporate sponsor of our webinar today, Unicure, who many of you are familiar with as they are conducting clinical trials for a uh, therapy for HD right now. So um, and I'd like to introduce you now to Stephen Finkbeiner, who is our speaker today. Um, Steve Finkbeiner is a senior investigator and the director of Center of the Center for Systems and Therapeutics and director of the Toby Corrett Center for Neurodegenerative Disease Research at Gladstone's Institutes, as well as a professor of neurology and physiology at the University of California, San Francisco. Steve is also the winner of the 2022 Leslie Gary Prize for Innovation in Science. The Leslie Gary Prize was established in 20, 2010 by founding director uh, Frank Gary and his family to honor the memory of his daughter, Leslie Gary. And Steve is the 13th recipient of the Gary Prize. So um, fun fact about Steve, I was just talking to him before the webinar started and um, Steve uh, holds the record at Yale apparently for getting his MD PhD in the, the fastest time possible, which is five years, which is really impressive. And Steve is, um, has his MD and his PhD, was a practicing neurologist for a number of years and then switched over to HD research. And he's been conducting Huntington's disease research for the past uh, more than 25 years. So welcome Steve. Um, and Steve will be talking today about how technology is transforming research. So thank you very much Steve for joining us today. Um, the question and answer button is open for anybody who wants to ask questions during Steve's presentation. And we'll have about 30 minutes at the end for Steve to answer all of your questions. Thanks for joining us. I'll turn it over now to Steve. Great, thank you so much, Megan. And uh, <laughs> thanks to the Hereditary Disease Foundation for their incredible commitment to HD research and uh, all the <clears throat> ways they've shaped and developed the field uh, since its inception. Um, I was asked today to talk a little bit about how technology uh, is transforming Huntington's disease research. And as Megan mentioned, um, I was given the uh, uh, the Geary Prize from the HDF. And so I thought maybe I would just show a couple examples. Um, we've really been driven by uh, the unmet needs of Huntington's research as we try to think of technological uh, innovations. And so I'd like to give you a couple examples, both scientific and non-scientific of uh, how we've gone about this. So the first example I'd like to give you is a question that comes up a lot in disease research, and that is, what is the biological significance of what we see? It's a really important question because we not only need to understand the mechanisms of Huntington's disease, but we really need to know what we should be targeting to ultimately develop a therapy that could help uh, patients. So what I'm showing you here is a picture of a neuron, and you see sort of a white spot inside the center of the cell. That's the nucleus of the cell. These are abnormal protein deposits called inclusions. And when we first entered the HD field, uh, people appreciated the presence of these structures and noticed that they uh, were found in Huntington's brain tissue, but it was unclear what role they played in the disease. A lot of people thought they actually caused neurodegeneration, but there were some people who thought they might be just an incidental change, and a few who even thought they might be uh, coping responses. This, as I said, is a recurring type of question in disease research. Um, we know a lot about different neurological diseases like Huntington's disease from uh, studies that pathologists have done from patient tissue where they will look carefully at patient tissue and look for differences between tissue from patient brains compared with uh, healthy brains. 
And these end up being described as clinical or pathological hallmarks. I've got them numbered here in circles here. This is just sort of a hypothetical example. And uh, pathologists have carefully noticed when these things appear in relation to the disease. And so you end up with this sort of idea that there's a sequence of events that, uh, that characterize the disease. And I think it's tempting sometimes to jump to the conclusion that one leads to the other in a causal chain. But what we've learned over the years is that it's much more complicated than that. The brain is a remarkable structure uh, and it undergoes a lot of plastic adaptive changes uh, normally that you know, produce good things like memories, but then it uh, can also lead to adaptive changes in the context of disease to try to cope. Uh, and sometimes those changes are even maladaptive. And it's really important uh, for our purpose to try to understand which things are actually causal uh, uh, events in the disease, which things might be incidental because targeting those won't really do make a difference, and which things might actually be coping responses because maybe that actually offers us a new strategy. Maybe we can somehow harness the body's natural coping mechanisms to help stave off disease. And I think although we oftentimes focus on when symptoms um, first appear in Huntington's disease, one of the remarkable things is that uh, those individuals have had the Huntington gene their entire lives and yet oftentimes don't develop symptoms until the fifth or sixth decade. So what enables the brain to stave off those symptoms for so long? Could we somehow harness that? Well, we couldn't figure out a way to really uh, resolve this question about inclusion bodies, or for that matter, uh, any of the other related questions about understanding the biological significance of what we saw, unless we had some way to be able to follow the whole process from beginning to end, watch how these things appear, and then understand ultimately what happens to that same cell eventually. And so <clears throat> one of our first inventions is something we call a robotic microscope. You see a robotic incubator here. There's a little robot that delivers the plate to that nest. We integrated uh, for the first time a robotic arm that transfers the plate to a fully automated microscope. There's one system here in the foreground. There's a second system in the background. <clears throat> and the key thing we did with this microscope was to automate it so that it could take an image, tell where that plate is in space exactly, so that you could put the plate back automatically in the incubator and bring it back out the next minute, day, month, and go back to exactly the same well and even the same microscope field so that you could identify and follow individual brain cells over time. And so in the lower right here, you're seeing a movie where we collected one image per day and you can see how the neurons are sort of growing their neurites, those processes out uh, over that time period. And you can see how finely aligned that is. That turned out to be really important because now for the first time, we could track individual cells over uh, whatever length of time it took to be able to see features of Huntington's disease and use some of the same tools that we use for clinical trials with people, only in this case, we're using neurons instead of people. And so what I'm showing you here is one of the first applications of the new technology to that original question I mentioned to you about what role inclusion bodies play. And here we had created a primary neuron model of Huntington's disease where we had introduced a version of Huntington that causes disease. And it was tagged with a protein that fluoresces green, green fluorescent protein, and that's of the lower panel. And then in the upper panel, we included a protein that fluoresces in a different color, red, <clears throat> that's unrelated to Huntington and just lets us look at the um, shape of the cell and whether it's alive or not. In the lower panel, you can see that in two of the cells, uh, at some time point, we see a bright dot appear, uh, and that's uh, the inclusion body uh, that I'd mentioned earlier. You can see it up here uh, in the, uh, with a yellow arrow uh, higher up. And so finally, for the first time, we had the ability to observe as pathology appeared and then ultimately follow that cell and look at the red color to see when that cell died and understand what the relationship of the two was. I told you uh, before that a lot of people thought these uh, inclusion bodies actually were required for neurodegeneration to occur and might be causal. But when we actually uh, did the calculations and quantified the relationship, we were surprised to find that it turned out to be just the opposite. And this happens a lot in science. Uh, sometimes uh, as smart as we try to be, we're often surprised by the results that we get. So in other words, cells that form these structures 
on average and everything else controlled did better than cells that didn't given the same dose of Huntington. So it was as if the cell was trying to mothball mutant Huntington into these structures to maybe make it less troublesome uh, than it would be if it was floating around. Well, I'm gonna summarize now, as Megan said, I've been working on this field for a long time. I'll, I'll summarize for you some of the insights that we learned from studying the dynamics of Huntington, which uh, became uniquely possible with this auto automated longitudinal uh, microscopy system. So we think proteins like Huntington are prone to misfold because of the CAG expansion. They form these shapes that we think are toxic to cells, probably in part by placing stress on the normal pathways in cells that refold cells and clear uh, uh, misfolded proteins. And in that context, we actually think those structures that we see, those inclusion bodies, may actually be a temporary coping response to help reduce the a level of those um, more toxic forms of the protein. And so this was very helpful to us because uh, initially people were thinking about trying to prevent inclusion body formation, so as a therapeutic target, but we worried that might actually make things worse, not better, uh, you know, particularly if it was targeted downstream. And instead, it led us to sort of think about a blueprint for intervention that focused on trying to instead bolster some of the clearing pathways, so some of those normal uh, coping pathways that exist in cells to be able to clear these proteins. And I don't have time today, but we have developed small molecules to stimulate a pathway called autophagy to help clear uh, these misfolded proteins. Uh, and they look really promising. Well, I'll sh show you another example now. So I'll give you an example of a technology platform. Um, <clears throat> as I showed you, we applied the technology platform to a model of Huntington's disease. And, and you know, that's how uh, we in the laboratory try to make progress is using models of the disease to understand um, and to find therapies. <clears throat> Mice play a really important role in neurologic disease studies uh, because genetically they look a lot. They're very similar to human beings. Uh, but it's been a little frustrating because there have been a number of uh, therapeutic interventions, both for Huntington's disease, but even other neurodegenerative disorders that have looked very promising in mice, but then go on to fail in clinical trials. And so a lot of us have been puzzling over why that is <clears throat> and what we might be able to do to mitigate uh, that issue. And there are many possibilities, but certainly one is that there are actually some important differences between mice and humans. And sometimes with a drug, all it takes is just a single amino acid difference in certain proteins to really make a difference both in the safety and toxicity of a drug. So um, I'm sure many in the, in the audience have heard about this technology before. I mention it um, because Huntington's disease was one of the very first focuses of the National Institutes of Health uh, in investing in this technology. And this was to develop models from patients based on patient cells using a technology called induced pluripotent stem cell technology. When we first started, uh, I used to collect skin biopsies, so take skin cells. Nowadays, we mostly just collect blood cells. Um, but once we have those cells, we can introduce genes into those that take them and turn them from a skin cell or a blood cell back into something called a pluripotent stem cell. So that's a cell that can really become anything. Uh, it's, and in fact, what I'm showing you here in the lower right is an example where we took a skin cell, turned it into a stem cell, and then used a recipe to turn that stem cell into heart cells. And so you can see the cells beating here. You can even see a blood vessel pumping blood cells through the, uh, uh, through the tissue. And of course, for Huntington's disease, we're primarily interested in making um, brain cells. And the exciting thing is over the years, recipes have been developed to make the same types of neurons that are most vulnerable in Huntington's disease, including medium spiny neurons and cortical neurons, but also other cell types that are probably important for the disease, including some immune cells called microglia, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes. What's happened more recently is that people have begun now to develop recipes that go from just making single cell types into making structures that resemble to some extent small mini brains. Um, they're called organoids. And I won't go through the details here, but suffice it to say that you know, adding different ingredients at different days causes these cells to self-aggregate and then to become to self-organize and eventually become these structures that have some of the same layers that you see in the human brain. So that's very exciting because uh, the 
we think in general that the closer that we can get to something that resembles a brain, a human brain in particular, the better chance we'll have of having a model that will be useful for teaching us lessons about Huntington's we can rely on and for finding drugs that are more likely to work when we give them to patients. One of the challenges though that we had with this is that uh, it didn't work very well initially with our microscope. And so that uh, required some additional innovation, uh, technology innovation in this case. What we had to do was use a 3D printer to create new holders to be able to hold the samples uh, and fit them on our microscope. And um, that's worked very well. We now can uh, do high throughput automated four-dimensional imaging of these organoids and really get beautiful images. Uh, and here's an example of an organoid where uh, we've been able to introduce genetic perturbations into those cells. So with this system, we have the ability to test cell transplantation as well as uh, testing the effect of different targets um, by genetic perturbation on those cells. So we're very excited about this approach as another complementary uh, uh, innovation and technology advance to transform HD research. Well, um, uh, just taking a little bit of a step back, I think, you know, a lot of us are frustrated that uh, the progress has been slower than we'd like um, for developing therapies for Huntington's disease. And I, and I think there's sort of a bigger elephant in the room, and that is that uh, the brain is incredibly complex, biology is complex. Some of you may be chess players, and I'm struck that, you know, chess only has 32 playing pieces. Um, but if you do the calculation, uh, there's 10 to the 120th games possible. And that's because every time you make one move, uh, you have many other options available. So uh, the combinations give you that huge number. So even if someone as smart as our HDF CEO, Megan, played speed chess 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would take longer than the universe has existed to play all those games. <laughs> and remember, this is a relatively simple game with just 32 pieces. So think about the human cell, which is much more complex. It has many more playing pieces and the moves it can do are much more complex. And this is where I think there might be an opportunity um, for artificial intelligence. And I'm very excited about uh, these new tools. Um, we had done a little bit of work in this area years ago, but uh, we really got catalyzed when I sort of got a call out of the blue from Google who wanted us to be their first collaborators uh, to apply AI tools to uh, some of these research problems. Um, the terminology can be a little confusing, so let me just um, uh, quickly remind people. AI is just a very broad term. It's been around since the 50s uh, and refers to sort of an ability of the machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. Um, there's a subset of artificial intelligence called machine learning. The key idea with machine learning is that the computer learns by example. So that's in contrast to a lot of ways that we tell computers to do work when we write computer programs that exactly specify what the computer can, should do. In this case, the computer learns sort of by itself by just showing it examples of data and uh, asking it to make some sort of um, perform some sort of task. It basically learns how to do it itself. And then something you may have heard about deep learning, which is now really used widely uh, for, you know, um, Netflix to tell you what movies you're going to like or dating apps to find who you should date. Uh, basically, it uses a very fancy form of um, a neural networks to be able to, uh, to learn, uh, to do the learning part. And <clears throat> I'll just show you an example. So, as you probably gathered from what I showed you before, one of the really important things that we want to be able to measure in the laboratory is neurodegeneration. And not only do we want to be able to you know, detect it, we would really like to determine the earliest time point when a neuron makes a decision to undergo neurodegeneration, because the earlier we can detect it, the greater chance we'll have to intervene and to change the course of uh, things. Now, we had tried many years just to have people look at images and to be able to make that determination, but we found out that humans just aren't that good at it. Um, they would sometimes disagree. Sometimes we would even give the same image to the same person the next day and they give it a different label. They, you know, they hadn't really weren't aware. And so we needed a, a more reliable system. And so um, a postdoctoral fellow, a trainee in my lab, developed a new biosensor uh, based on that green fluorescent protein that I mentioned to you before. Uh, and what this green fluorescent protein was modified to do was to detect calcium. Um, this is an ion that is uh, 
kept at a very low level in healthy cells. And uh, people had already developed ways to make uh, this fluorescent protein sensitive to calcium to be able to measure when neurons uh, exhibit electrical activity because their calcium levels change. His thought was that maybe um, you could retune this so that it uh, uh, detects calcium at a higher level, maybe a, a threshold level beyond which uh, neurons are committed to die. So uh, this is sort of the dose response curve of this biosensor uh, for normal neuronal activity. His idea was when calcium gets, when cells can make a commitment to die, maybe their calcium level gets high. And so maybe we could retune this to um, detect that level. And this might be a biosensor for neurodegeneration. Well, to make a long story short, it turns out it worked really well. Uh, we followed over 100,000 cells with our robots, and we've never seen a single one uh, that shows a signal with this biosensor that has gone on to live. Uh, we've now been able to use it in both primary neurons and uh, human patient-derived neurons, and it works great. So normally the story would end there. You know, Here's another example of how technology and innovation has um, really helped us uh, in HD research. But he was very curious, why couldn't humans do a better job? Uh, why were they only about 70% accurate when this biosensor is essentially 100% accurate? And so he wondered uh, if you could train a deep learning network to be able to do something a human couldn't do, which is to sort of reliably detect this event just based on the shape change of the cell. So to do this, he used our robots and he collected images of cells, some that showed this yellow um, uh, signal, which is a cell destined to die based on our biosensor, and those that are still green, which are healthy. Um, and with our robots, uh, he could collect images of 23,000 cells in just a couple days, uh, and with our computer pipelines, carve them up into these little portraits that we can use to train deep learning networks. Um, he used these data and fed them into a deep learning network and asked the deep learning network to tell us whether it could tell uh, whether a cell was destined to die or was expected to live. Remember, my lab's been trying to do this for 20 years, staring at pictures, uh, and humans could no never do better than 70 to 80%. Well, it turns out, after just two and a half hours of training on a deep learning network, it already was able to predict uh, dead cells with 95% accuracy, and with just a few little tweaks to the deep learning network, we got to 100%. So, the short answer is yes, uh, deep learning networks can, can, and we've seen this many times, oftentimes see things in our data that humans can't see and detect things with greater accuracy and certainly greater speed than humans can do. And I really do think this is going to transform uh, research for Huntington's disease and for other things. This is just one example. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, one of the things, of course, uh, everyone wants to know is, well, how does it do it? Uh, it's that's remarkable. Um, it's useful, but it'd be great if we understood better how it did it. And that's been challenging until a few years ago because these networks uh, end up uh, generating such complicated sort of nonlinear mathematical relationships that it's been very difficult to actually figure it out just by looking at the networks. But new tools have been developed called explanatory AI tools or interpretable AI tools. This one is a fancy one called gradient weighted class activation mapping. The name is not important. Um, just suffice it to say that it allows us to, to basically do little perturbations on the images and then see how the network responds. And then that reveals to us what is it in the image that the network discovered that made it enable it to make these superhuman classifications? And I'm showing you just some examples here that to our surprise, the network had discovered two features, one that enabled it to predict which cells were alive that had to do with um, pixels around the edges of the cell and especially around those processes called neurites. The other were pixels in the nucleus that seemed to be really important that we hadn't frankly even noticed before uh, that the deep learning network found to be reliable predictors of which cells were destined to die. We're excited about this because <clears throat> we've even now begun to use this predictive algorithm to be able to identify cells days before they're gonna die and now be able to go in and do other uh, experiments on those cells to understand what is it that is really driving that decision and can we um, intervene to be able to get the cell to essentially change its mind. So the last example I wanna give you is um, 
a sort of not a scientific uh, innovation, but you know, many of us in the Huntington's uh, disease research field, I know many HD patients and families, and uh, you know, and we want desperately to find uh, therapies to, to make a difference for patients. And one of the surprising things I discovered 10 years into my faculty career was that, you know, even though we were working very diligently in the lab to make discoveries and understand mechanisms, there still was this really critical step of being able to move those discoveries out of our lab uh, into drug development to be able to ultimately get to the clinic. And one of the things they didn't teach me in medical school was that, uh, you know, although as an MD, PhD, you know, my job was clear, I was supposed to do the basic research to understand and identify targets and try to validate them, uh, understand mechanisms. But it is often the case that uh, where the uh, academic research ends is oftentimes, at least in the view of drug companies, still too early uh, for them to pick up, to move into the clinic. Uh, they feel that it's just too risky. You know, as I mentioned before, a lot of the things that look promising in mice go on to fail in, in humans. And so it creates this so-called valley of death uh, that uh, it, it creates a gap between where things end in academia and where things need to be to really engage industry. And so uh, one of the, the, the things we've worked on is develop a center called the Toby Corret Center for Neurodegenerative Disease, which primarily focused on Huntington's disease. And the idea was um, to really deal with this problem of having promising discoveries that kind of get stuck in academia, but nowhere to go, and try to create a structure that might help us more successfully move them out. And so um, that's really the, the mission of the center. We've really tried to focus on trying to connect these two, bridge this gap with very targeted philanthropy. And, uh, and then the goal is to really to um, do what we need to be able to engage drug companies who really have a lot of expertise that frankly we're missing in academia, including medicinal chemistry, uh, expertise with safety and toxicity and doing clinical trials. And so um, the center involves uh, <clears throat> really a sort of incubator uh, within an academic structure that's geared toward doing the things it needs to to tee things up for an industry partnership. And sometimes that in involves engaging outside entities like contract research organizations, but definitely involves a close interaction with a lot of supporting agencies eventually to do these um, uh, partnerships. I will say that um, one of the challenges with Huntington's disease, which again, I didn't really appreciate until really we tried to uh, forge ahead to develop these um, partnerships is that, you know, um, not only is neurological disease a risky place for drug companies to work, at least that's their view, um, but some companies, based on their size and, and who's there, primarily are interested in some diseases and not other diseases. And so even the um, potential partners for Huntington's disease may be uh, somewhat limited. So one of the things that we have done is to try to come up with uh, a a way to identify maybe common pathways. So things that are relevant to Huntington's disease, but also uh, mechanisms of neurodegeneration that may also be relevant for certain other disorders. Because uh, if we could develop therapies to that, not only would that help Huntington's patients, um, but it may broaden uh, our ability to attract pharmaceutical partners. I'll also say too, since uh, the first example I gave you was where inclusion bodies appear to be a coping response, that there are clearly opportunities um, to not only focus on common causal pathways, but also I think potential adaptive, both harmful and beneficial adaptive responses that the brain develops and that may also play a role in disease. And as I mentioned, uh, there is this concern that sometimes some of our model systems don't reliably predict what will work in the clinic. And so another uh, rational, rationale for doing this is the idea that if we find something that works in multiple models and multiple diseases, hopefully that will demonstrate that this really is something that we can uh, hopefully depend on. And I'm pleased to say that that strategy seems to have worked. So we've had many, many, um, and continue to have many uh, relationships with drug companies and, and information technology companies uh, to try to develop some of these things, move things out both from the academic lab, but also to even bring some of the innovation in, uh, that I've talked about uh, with you today uh, to drug companies that don't actually have it internally. They really depend on the innovation from academia. And so we can put together partner around certain programs.
So I'll finish there. I just want to, uh, I'm so grateful and so blessed to have uh, really a talented group of both biologists, computer scientists, and engineers. We've also um, been very fortunate to have uh, tremendous uh, collaborators. The Huntington's disease research field is just amazing as far as that goes. And, uh, you know, we don't get too many opportunities to talk to patients and families. Uh, and so I do want to make sure I take this special um, opportunity to just say again, um, you know, how thankful and grateful I am for all that you do. Uh, you know, sometimes with these spotlights, you almost get the sense that it's the scientists. And it's true, innovative science is really important. You know, the HDF has been absolutely catalytic when it comes to supporting collaboration and science. Uh, and I've told you a little bit about, you know, we really need to cross this valley of death and effective strategy to engage pharma. Um, but really, this whole thing would not work without HD patients and donors. Um, you know, your commitment to have an impact and your willingness to participate in clinical trials is absolutely essential uh, for us to, to be successful. So uh, I think, um, you know, everyone playing their part is going to be really key to overall success. So thank you so much uh, for your attention, and I'm certainly happy to take any questions. Thank you, Steve. That was really an excellent presentation. And I think um, everyone watching uh, can agree why you have been awarded the Leslie Gary Prize for Innovation in Science. You talked about so many interesting um, innovations and um, congratulations on, um, on winning the prize. And just to start, I'd love it if you could share with our audience the actual prize that you received. This was designed by um, Frank Gehry, renowned architect and HDF um, founding member. So um, would love it if you could share that with us and then yeah. we can start the Q&A. <laughs> there, there it is for the audience. Yeah, yeah and it was so tremendously I meaningful to me. I think Frank Gehry, uh, such a creative and innovative person. And I think a lot of times uh, people don't appreciate just how important creativity and innovation is to science. It really oftentimes is the thing that uh, hopefully, as I showed you today, allows you to finally answer questions that have been unanswerable with available technology. So terrific. Okay, well, I'm going to take a look at the questions. First of all, thank you, everybody, for introducing yourselves in the chat. And if you um, want to keep doing that, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we've got a few questions now. And I want to just say to people, I know we've got a lot of scientists online and a lot of um, HD family members as well. So please feel free to ask questions that are technical or that are non-technical. No question is a bad question. So please uh, type away. We've got a lot of, um, a lot of things to uh, talk about. So first, um, first question is from somebody named Ryan Van Dyke um, asking, is artificial intelligence being routinely and currently used in labs to find a treatment or is it still too premature? Yeah, thanks, Ryan, for the question. Um, <clears throat> so it um, it's still pretty early days, I would say. Uh, you know, and I think one of the things to to remember about science is that the skill sets that are required can often be very different. So, the skill sets that people uh, generally need to do artificial intelligence are kind of more related to uh, math and uh, computer science and programming, and it has historically not been uh, a major focus for the training of biology graduate students or frankly, medical doctors too. Um, I think that's changing. Uh, and it's certainly, I've even seen already folks in my lab who just began as biologists, but got so excited by what they saw these things to do. And one of the great things I think about AI is that there are so many opportunities just to take online courses, frankly, and to even do self-directed training. So I'm very optimistic that um, uh, that this is going to change in academic research. Some universities also have computer science departments. And I think increasingly when I go out and give talks, I encourage excited biologists to take their local computer scientists out for a cup of coffee and, uh, and learn to, uh, and to do something with them. The language and culture of those two groups is very different. So it does take a lot of effort uh, to kind of and determination to work together, but I think it's possible. I will say on the other side in industry, they have recognized the power of these approaches. And I would say they have, in fact, a number of the collaborations we have were actually driven by industry that wants to get into this area. And so I think they are um, 
a little ahead of where academia is. And so it's being used <clears throat> extensively now, especially for medicinal chemistry. Great, thanks for that, Steve. Um, another question from um, an anonymous. Um, will the recent release of artificial intelligence such as chat GBT have an immediate use for HD research? Yeah, so um, for folks who aren't familiar, uh, there's a, uh, a company called OpenAI, which is actually just a couple blocks from my lab, has developed this new technology called ChatGPT. Uh, and um, now Google just announced one yesterday, Bing, uh, a lot of the companies are trying to develop these generative AI um, approaches. Uh, it's a little unclear at the moment how we'll apply that to Huntington's disease research. Although I will say people already in my lab have discovered ways to use it to write code, to be able to take code other people have written and have it analyze it. So I think we're, it's, a really, it's really too early probably to see what impact it's going to have, but I think it is going to be I, I think it's going to be really transformative. Uh, so I think that's another one, you know, just, I think that's another reason I think we wanted to really see what AI had to offer because that field moves so much faster than biology. Uh, I think it's going to be an exciting time to see the new tools that are developed and to think of creative ways to apply them. Great, thank you. That's really exciting. And I'm not surprised at all to learn that uh, that members of your lab have already started finding ways to use this to uh, move the research forward. So very great to hear. Um, we've got a question here from John Stevens, who's um, one of our supporters and he writes, um, let's see, what, uh, let's see, what led you to join the HD universe 20 plus years ago? And are you seeing more quote, use joining the HD field, like more Steve Finkbinders joining the HD field? Oh, thanks for that question. Um, you know, it's kind of a funny story, to be honest. Um, I was uh, an intern, medical intern, which is the lowest level of the medical ladder. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I was post-call after uh, a night in the emergency room, and I got a note in my mailbox that the chancellor of my university wanted to see me, which was terrifying. I thought I was being fired. Uh, and so I got escorted into his room and classical music was playing. He brought out a tea service. I thought I'd landed in heaven. Uh, it was Joe Martin, who uh, was, as many of you know, the former chair of neurology at Mass General and part of the effort to form the team to find the Huntington gene. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> turned out he was a friend of my PhD mentor. Excuse me. And... Um, yeah, and so he he really encouraged me to think about Huntington's disease. Uh, he was very excited about it and um, thought it was a really interesting disorder. And I was becoming a neurology resident, and so uh, I didn't forget that. And then uh, when I went on to do a fellowship, I, I thought that a lot of the tools and approaches we were using might be useful for generating a cell model of Huntington's disease. And we went on and did that. And that's actually where when H HDF discovered me uh, as a lowly postdoc. Um, and so you asked me how, how to get other me's in, in here. And I think if, if the audience doesn't know it, that's one of the uh, maybe untold stories of the HDF. They, you know, Nancy and others from the very beginning have been remarkably proactive in trying to figure out what the field needs and to reach out to people at every level, uh, new trainees, as well as more senior scientists to try to bring those folks in. And it's such a warm and inviting and collaborative community uh, that uh, it just does it kind of does the work by itself once you get people interested. Great, thanks for, thanks for answering that, Steve. Um, we have a, a question here from Peter Mantis, um, who's asking, do you think administration slash delivery directly into the brain to penetrate the blood brain barrier, like Unicure's HD program, will set an important precedent for future rare neurodisease research? Yeah, so I think the, um, the question really gets at the issue of how do you get therapies for brain diseases into the brain. And unlike um, some of the, uh, you know, things outside the brain where the blood can bring a, a drug directly to the tissue uh, and there, there typically aren't 
enormous issues. There is this thing called the blood-brain barrier, which is a barrier that's formed by the interface between one type of brain cell called an astrocyte and um, the blood vessels. And, you know, a lot of people think that that barrier really is designed to protect the brain from things that might float around the body, but might damage the brain. So it serves a good purpose, but one of the challenges it creates for people like us is that it makes it harder to get drugs into the brain. So oftentimes drugs have to be, the molecules have to be smaller, they have to have certain um, different, you know, more constrained features to be able to get it into the brain. So I agree, I think for um, certain therapies, particularly ones that are geared toward gene therapy, uh, it may be the case that uh, approaches like Yernicure uh, and other uh, companies that are trying to do viral delivery, where we have to um, basically physically disrupt the blood-brain barrier to get the therapy where we want may be an important approach. But I wouldn't give up on small molecule therapies too. There are plenty of examples of drugs that have successfully uh, got across the blood-brain barrier. So I think it's really gonna depend on um, what the therapy is, what we're trying to target and what the drug is. Oh, Megan, I think you're um, muted. Yes, yes, I am muted. Sorry, I was. Uh, thanks for that, Steve. Um, got a question here from Steve, uh, so from Susan Martin asking, um, can you talk a little bit more about the intersection of Parkinson's, ALS, and Alzheimer's with Huntington's? Are there scientists who work together on all of those diseases? Well, we certainly work on all of those diseases. Uh, I'd have to give it some thought. There, are, Oftentimes, scientists will work on a couple diseases. I'm, I can't, I, I have to think really hard to think if there's another, another one who works on all of them like that. Um, but yeah, thank you for the question. I think one of the, um, there are, you know, from our perspective, there are these, uh, we do think there are some common threads that do cut across multiple uh, diseases. Um, I mentioned one of the common threads uh, when I started my talk, and that is that proteins um, are prone to misfold. Uh, and in some cases, there are rare genetic mutations that cause disease in ALS and Parkinson's disease um, that cause those proteins to misfold, as happens in Huntington's disease. And so one of the common features that you see across multiple diseases is the abnormal uh, deposit of these misfolded proteins. There are different proteins for the different diseases. Uh, one of the common ones in Parkinson's is a protein called synuclein. For ALS, uh, it's TDP43. And as you know, for Huntington, it's Huntington. Um, but the machinery that cells use to refold proteins and to get rid of proteins that are catastrophically misfolded is shared across all disorders. And the different diseases may utilize them a little differently, but we do think that's an, an example of a great opportunity. Uh, and and you know, I gave you one example of a clearance pathway today called the autophagy lysosomal pathway that we think might be a really exciting pathway. In fact, the small molecules that I mentioned to you that uh, seem to help in our Huntington's models also help in our uh, ALS models and our, our Parkinson's models too. So that would be an example where uh, being able to look at these different diseases and looking at what's different and what's the same may point us to pathways and targets that might be especially attractive um, therapeutic candidates and ones where it's going to be easier to get pharmaceutical companies involved and make the big investments uh, that we need. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, actually, I have a question of my own. Um, you did such a great job of going through so much of the HD research. And for our lay um, listeners, um, I love the fact that you explained what iPSCs um, are, and then you talked about the organoids. Could you just talk a little bit more about why these are important? Because I think our, our non-scientists in the audience, probably when they read about HD research or reading iPSCs and people don't necessarily understand what that is and why that is so important. I know you talked a little bit about it, but I'd love it if you could just maybe just talk a tiny bit more about it just to express just why that is so important for HD research. Sure. Yeah, I think, the, um, you know, in my opinion, um, one, one reason it's so important is this issue that uh, we think trying to create models of disease that are fully human 
are going to give us a better chance at finding things that work in human patients. Uh, that there may be some species specific differences uh, that arise when we study non human models that may make it uh, less reliable, both in terms of the insights we gain to understand the causes of disease, but also to find the things that are most likely going to work when we move them out. So, and I think in general, um, certainly the direction the drug companies have been going is increasingly trying to really uh, focus their efforts on targets where there's a really strong human genetic connection. Again, trying to really uh, connect the dots as closely as possible uh, before they invest the efforts. And part of that is based on a retrospective evidence that if you have closer links to the human disease, the chance that you'll get an FDA approved drug out the other end go up two to three to fourfold or something like that. So that's one reason. Um, I think that um, the, you know, as you sort of study more specifically some of the differences too between humans and um, uh, non-human models, um, we know that, uh, for example, a patient with Huntington's disease with a certain CAG expansion, particularly common ones sort of in the 40 to 45 range, they can get symptoms as early as 20, symptoms as late as 70 or 80, or not even get symptoms at all. And so what is, you know, what is the reason that's that happens. We think that part of it has to do with other genes in the human genome that influence how severe Huntington's disease is. And that's going to be much easier to study in a human model than it will be in a non-human model because we'll have that genetic background that we that, that's uniquely human. Does that answer your question, Megan? Oh, I think you're muted again. I'm on mute again. Yes, yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, it does answer my question. So thank you. I just wanted to really stress the importance of, um, you know, why, why these models are just so important to have something that's closer to humans. Um, we've got a quite a technical question here and um, let, let's see what you can do with it. Um, it's, would it be possible to look at strategies that parasites like Toxoplasma gondii and Plasmodium fel falciparum used across the blood brain barrier and come up with novel ways to breach brain microvasculature. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I, I'll say that that's a, you know, it's a very active area of research. Um, <clears throat> and so a number of companies, you know, have been trying to tackle that, the crossing the blood brain barrier issue uh, several different ways. So I mentioned to you, um, <clears throat> people have uh, for example, study very carefully the small molecules that do get across the blood-brain barrier, and they've devised a whole set of rules for chemists about sort of what criteria the small molecule needs to meet to have a good chance of getting across the blood-brain barrier. And so, you know, we've we've done this ourselves. So for the autophagy inducers that I mentioned to you, we worked with medicinal chemists using those rules and then making modifications to the chemistry. And those dramatically increased the ability of those small molecules to get across the blood-brain barrier. So um, I just wanna underscore that uh, it's absolutely possible. And it's not always possible every time, but um, it's definitely possible. So there are well-established ways to do that. Um, we talked about some of the other approaches um, before about viral delivery and sort of surgical ways to do it. Um, Denali is an, another uh, a drug company that's developed a proprietary way to use antibodies and transporters that exist on the blood-brain barrier uh, uh, cells to be able to get things across, uh, proteins in particular, that generally are too big to get across the blood-brain barrier. So I just want to underscore to the whole audience that this is definitely a, uh, an area of uh, ongoing active work. Um, and it's true, it's a challenge, but uh, I wouldn't characterize it as the biggest challenge in the field. So, and it's also, you know, been solved many times. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Bernadette Barrett, um, who is complimenting you, well-deserved award, and asking, would you say neuronal replacement in an HD patient's brain is years away? And I know you didn't talk about neuronal replacement, but maybe you could give us a few comments on, on that subject. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, there's a, been uh, a lot of interest in the possibility of somehow uh, regenerating 
parts of the brain that get lost in Huntington's disease uh, and other neurodegenerative diseases. And some of the initial thoughts were primarily focused on putting in neurons that were lost, um, but people also have been interested and are pursuing the possibility of uh, also introducing support cells. Um, there are also strategies that have been developed. Um, some colleagues here at Gladstone, where I work, have done this already for heart disease, where they've been able to, uh, you know, after a heart attack, when uh, heart muscle cells die, um, they get replaced by a fibrotic scar. And some of the folks here have developed ways to be able to reprogram those scars to become muscle cells again. So the, another strategy is to not even do transplantation is just to use cells that already exist there and convert them into the cells that we need or that get lost during disease. So <clears throat> what I can say for sure is that this is an uh, area of a lot of activity and interest. Uh, and there are ongoing clinical trials for various uh, cell replacement therapies. Leslie Thompson, uh, who's involved at the HDF, is involved in one of these. Um, but as I think the questioner is sort of intimating, there are some pretty big challenges. Uh, so one of the key things about neurons is that they have those long extensions, axons and dendrites, and those kind of need to be connected properly and wired right <clears throat> in order for the neuron to serve a useful purpose. And historically, that's been really challenging. Uh, and a lot of people for many years, even before stem cells and transplantation techniques, have been working, for example, with patients who have spinal cord injury, trying to get parts of the spinal cord to regrow and reconnect. And it's just turned out to be a really challenging problem, uh, probably in part because sometimes during the injury, scars get formed that block uh, those reconnections getting made, and partly uh, because the environment that the uh, cells are growing in isn't the same as it was when the nervous system was first being developed, and so uh, it's harder. And these connections can travel over very long distances, so getting the neurons to kind of not only live and kind of be transplanted, but to get them to rewire and connect to the right parts of the brain uh, continues to be a big challenge. So um, so the good news is a lot of active work and, um, and there have been some definitely encouraging uh, results from uh, non-human studies, but there's still some pretty big challenges in the field uh, as well. Thanks for that, Steve. I'm going to ask the audience if they'd like to submit some more questions because Steve, I'm just amazed that there doesn't seem to be any question for which you don't have a very long and interesting <laughs> explanation. So please, um, we've got a couple more minutes for questions. Um, in the meantime, we've got uh, a question coming from Aris um, Polizo saying, very, very nice talk. Do you have any, and this you addressed this a little bit before, so do you have any indications or insights into what differences between mice and humans are confounding them as HD models? That is such a great question, and um, so many reviews have been written about this. Unfortunately, it's sort of, at this point, still speculation, so I can tell you some of the differences. So, um, First of all, just at the genetic level, even though um, there's tremendous uh, homology, you know, humans and mice share, uh, you know, at the gene level, there's tremendous overlap. But if you get down to the actual sequence level where, you know, you're looking at individual amino acids, there are quite a few differences. And one of the things too, that's been sort of a head scratcher is um, a lot of the disease genes, neurological disease genes in mice uh, have some curious amino acid changes. So it's not so much for Huntington, but say for Parkinson's, for example, there's a mutation uh, in humans that has been linked to Parkinson's disease that's the normal sequence in mouse. And so what does that mean? Uh, same thing with another protein called apolipoprotein E, which is one of the major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, mice have different versions. Um, there's a protein called tau, which is very important for Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that mice make really a different isoform, a different splice isoform than humans. So that, that's just a handful of examples of, you know, genes that are really important for human disease, and they're all different at some level in mice. And, and so, you know, oftentimes what modelers try to do is to put in a human version of the disease-causing gene, but 
I think it's important to keep in mind that they've just changed that one gene. There are so many other genes that influence whether disease happens <clears throat> and um, those remain mouse genes. So, uh, so the environment's gonna be different. Um, we know that. The immune system's very different, it turns out, in mice than humans. And I know this is a controversial area and it's not really my um, main focus, so I don't wanna say anything that's gonna upset people but um, uh, in the field, but um, there are quite a few differences between the mouse immune system and the human immune system in its response to disease and things like that. And so that may be important. Um, you know, it's not really the focus of academic research, but but it's come up now several times in the question period, um, how animals metabolize drugs and whether it gets into the brain and things like that. Those are really important concerns for drug developers. Um, and it turns out that something, you know, how um, people metabolize drugs is called pharmacokinetics and um, whether, and uh, and there's also the issue of like what dose people can safely take. Those issues of pharmacokinetics and toxicity are very species specific. And so it's not even just mice, you know, some of the other types of animals that are used typically in drug development have very different pharmacokinetics than humans. And even something um, where sometimes we think of primates as potentially closer models to humans, they are in some respects, uh, but the, these things like toxicity and pharmacokinetics can be very different. So <clears throat> what we know for sure is that there are some uh, potentially big differences in non-human species compared to humans. We don't yet know what are the critical differences, you know, and, and are any of those things that we could change that would now make those models much more reliable in terms of going into humans? So it's a great question. I wish I had a better answer. Great. Um, got a couple more questions. And then um, if people have questions after the ending of the webinar, please just send them to us and um, perhaps Steve would be kind to answer them um, offline. So let's see, we have um, from Matthias Dose, regarding things that might happen before forming HTT, mRNA, EG, what do you think is the impact of solely reducing mutant Huntington protein, MHTT? Yeah, that's the, well, it's more than a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I think everyone, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I certainly um, was very hopeful that uh, lowering mutant Huntington would be enough to stop the progression of the disease and maybe even um, restore some some dysfunction that might arise during the disease. And part of the reason for saying that is that uh, there were studies early in uh, years ago where people had a version of Huntington you could turn on or off with a drug in a mouse. And uh, it was remarkable how if you um, turned it off after symptoms developed, uh, how much the mouse improved. Um, and then there have been a number of studies uh, that have tried to use some of the same approaches now that are being used in Huntington's patients to lower the gene. And those also looked really promising in mice. So, um, so, you know, for all those reasons, uh, our, and, and even work from our own lab um, using the robots I showed you and some of the measurements of Huntington in cells gave us the impression and led us to the conclusion too that the symptoms were highly dose dependent and lowering Huntington would help a lot. Um, I still think that's likely to be the case, but uh, I would be uh, remiss in not, you know, mentioning that this trial that we had recently with the Ionis and Roche drug was just a real surprise to me. Uh, and I think we still don't understand why the drug made patients worse in a dose-dependent way. I think the drug company thinks that it had to do with side effects uh, of overdosing the drug. And so if they use a better dose, that the results will be different. And so they're moving ahead now with an effort to try to test that. Um, but we can't exclude the possibility that there may be some features of Huntington's that may not respond to Huntington lowering. Uh, I, I personally, again, don't think that's true, but we'll have to, time will tell. Uh, and that's the importance of doing these clinical trials very carefully and trying to learn as much as we can um, from the tremendous heroic patients who participate in them.
Great, thank you, Steve. I'm gonna have one more question. I know we're running a tiny bit over time, but I think this is this basically kind of um, sums up one of your many um, one of your many many talents. So, a question from an anonymous attendee saying, "Who actually builds your technologies? Do you have engineers in your lab?" And I know the answer to this because I've asked this question in the past. Yeah, you know, I built the first one uh, on Saturday mornings. Uh, my wife would let me go to the lab and I would build them. Uh, and I blame it on all the Legos my parents gave me over the years. And I, I also, um, I'm from the Midwest and um, my mom's side of the family has a farm in North Dakota and we used to have to work on the farm. And, you know, when you're out in the field uh, and something breaks, you got to figure out how to fix it. It's either that or it's a long walk back home. So you end up getting really creative and resourceful. And uh, I learned how to weld and learned how to do a lot of things. So, yeah, I, <clears throat> I didn't really show it today, but even that stage on the microscope, I milled myself out of a block of aluminum. So, but yeah, now we have managed to attract a lot of engineers who uh, do a great job and um, do better than I do, so. Great, um, thank you, Steve. Steve, there's one more question that's super interesting. Um, I don't know if you have time to answer it. Um, I'm sure it you're quickly. probably familiar with it. It's from um, Ryan Van Dyke, and he asks, AADC deficiency was recently cured using gene therapy directly to a child's brain. Will this be immediately relevant to Huntington's disease, Huntington's treatment development? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I don't know if immediately relevant, but I would say it's another really encouraging uh, result. And, um, you know, P another example people may have heard of is spinal muscular atrophy. It's sort of a childhood form of ALS. Um, and people used essentially the same approach that is being used by Ionis and Roche um, in that disorder initially. These children, uh, you know, would get disease very early and die oftentimes six months to a year after birth. And now if these drugs are able to walk around and live uh, apparently normally. Uh, and so I think for, and that's another example of a drug that treats something that's on the other side of the blood brain barrier. So in the central nervous system, a genetic disorder um, with a drug that's similar to what we're using for Huntington's disease. And I think Having examples like this are really encouraging to the field and to the drug companies to keep, you know, soldiering on and, you know, giving us hope that that this approach, you know, we may have to still, you know, do some troubleshooting and some problem solving, but, uh, but it's really encouraging, you know, as another example of that this strategy can work. Great. Well, I want to thank you, Steve. <laughs> very, very much for joining us today. And thank you especially for all the work that you and your colleagues in the lab are doing to move the HD research forward. It's so important, as you know, and um, I'm really grateful to you for everything that you do. Um, thank you to all of you joining us today for coming and supporting us and learning more about the research that we support. Thank you to our donors and thank you to Unicure for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, we have our next webinar will be in March and that's going to feature Michelle Gray and Sophie St. Cyr talking about HD and cardiac health. So the registration is available for that now on our website. So please sign up and join us with um, those two speaking about the heart. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate you joining us and um, have a great day. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Steve.